Hello, everyone. This is probably the first time you're hearing my real voice. I've been wanting to try something new for a little while now. In addition to creating video game cover songs, I've been itching to talk about the video game music I love. So I'm trying my hand at video essays, specifically video game music analysis. I thought that the perfect place to start would be to talk about one of my favorite games on the Switch, Super Mario Odyssey. Nintendo's latest Mario masterpiece is an excellent demonstration of their philosophy when it comes to creating games. Nintendo games are usually built around a central theme or game mechanic, which drives every other component of the game, including the art style and the music. Nintendo doesn't just create a game and then slap a theme on top of it. The gameplay informs the aesthetic experience of the game. For example, how Splatoon's paint-splattering gameplay naturally inspired both its ink-spitting squid protagonists and its punky, urban, graffiti art aesthetic. In the case of Super Mario Odyssey, the core gameplay theme is traveling around the world and experiencing foreign cultures. Travel is one of the main two themes which the developers have stated were driving factors behind the development of Mario Odyssey. And this gameplay theme plays into every aspect of the game, even down to its title. The game's title harkens back to Homer's epic poem, The Odyssey, which chronicles the hero Odysseus and his journey home from Troy. But today, the term refers to any long and epic journey around the world. Producer Yoshiaki Koizumi and director Kenta Motokura incorporated many of their own experiences traveling around the world into the game such as Motokura's trip to Mexico. Real-life cultures have a huge influence on many of the kingdoms in Odyssey, but I'll get more into that later. This core theme of travel is brilliantly captured in nearly every aspect of the game. One example is the visuals. Each kingdom has a distinct art style which evokes the feeling of unfamiliarity and surprise when visiting foreign places. This allowed the developers to play around with lots of environments never before seen in the Mario series. The visuals range from the whimsical, Halloween-fueled landscape of the Cap Kingdom, the blocky and almost plastic-looking foliage of the Lost Kingdom, to the quirky polygonal look of the Luncheon Kingdom, or the unusually realistic, straight-out-of-Dark Souls appearance of the Ruined Kingdom. These environments create a sense of curiosity, exploration, and discovery, and really evoke the genuine surprises the developers were going for. Even the most minor experiences involved with traveling around the world inspire gameplay elements in Odyssey. For example, the experience of converting between different currencies around the world gave the developers the idea of having regional coins only usable in its particular kingdom. All in all, the theme of traveling around the world is pretty smartly implemented into the game, both aesthetically and in terms of gameplay. But I want to delve deeper into one particular way this theme is evoked, the music. Much like the art style, the in-game collectibles, and the local inhabitants and enemies, the music differs significantly between each kingdom. The game's composers took on a wide array of genres and styles, many of which break completely new ground for the Mario series. This contributes to each kingdom's unique identity and reinforces that magical feeling of exploring a new place. Since most of the kingdoms are based on real-life locations, I'm going to go through each kingdom in order and explore the cultural background of the music, and examine how the music gives each kingdom a distinct feel. There's a lot to say, so this analysis will be in uh, two parts. This video will cover the kingdoms up until the Lost Kingdom. I'm also going to be skipping over the Cloud and the Ruined Kingdoms, as they do not have background music. To begin, let's jump right into the Cap Kingdom. The Cap Kingdom is based on England, specifically London. The architecture seen in the background is reminiscent of cityscapes from the Victorian period. The black metal railing of the fence and the ornate lampposts really capture this era's aesthetic. Even the climate perfectly represents the United Kingdom. 
Sea of mist and fog evokes London's famous pea soup fog and the general grey, dreary weather the UK is known for. The main design motif is the iconic top hat, a piece of apparel strongly associated with British culture, particularly worn by upper class men. The little ghosts wear these top hats, and often use stereotypical British expressions, giving them the aura of a dandy British gentleman. While the music doesn't exactly fit with a specific genre from Victorian era Britain, it's reminiscent of classical ballroom music associated with high-end European culture. Personally, I think the music is more so meant to create a whimsical and spooky feel. It particularly reminds me of the work of Danny Elfman with its twinkling celesta, whimsical xylophone, and plucked strings. This is fitting given Bonneton's dark atmosphere and its wonky, twisted landscape that looks as if Tim Burton and Dr. Seuss were hired as urban planners. The Cascade Kingdom isn't based on any particular location in the real world, but rather a time period, specifically the prehistoric era. Because of this, it's difficult to analyze the accuracy of the music of the Cascade Kingdom, as we have no idea what the music sounded like so long ago. It's almost certain that early humans made music. Musical instruments are known to have been created as far back as the Neanderthals. But there's no surviving evidence that tells us specifically what this would have sounded like. As such, the music of Fossil Falls isn't meant to emulate a particular style but it mainly serves to paint an image of the sprawling wilderness. Nintendo of America's Twitter account states that it was written to instill a sense of excitement to the start of your journey. This uplifting orchestral theme is truly memorable, and there's really not much else to say. So onwards to the Sand Kingdom. This is where things start to get really interesting. A number of kingdoms aren't just based on one location, but pull from a variety of cultures around the world. I personally love this. It grounds each locale in familiar environments while still making them feel unique. If every location were a one-to-one -one parallel with a real country, it might get boring or predictable or rely too heavily on overplayed stereotypes. Nintendo was smart to mix it up and keep bringing the surprises. The Sand Kingdom is a desert, and draws from pretty much any part of the world you can think of that is known for its deserts. Mexican, Egyptian, and Middle Eastern cultures all come together to make an exceptionally unique location. The town of Tostarena is based heavily on Latin America, especially Mexico. Even the name is very Spanish sounding. The local Tostarenans are inspired by the Mexican tradition of Dia de los Muertos. Their colorful painted skulls resemble the iconic calaveras, also known as sugar skulls. These decorative or sometimes edible representations of human skulls are rooted in Aztec, Mayan, and Toltec traditions. The Tostarenans wear traditional ponchos and sombreros, and are often seen playing the maracas, a type of shaker common in Latin music, as well as a special type of large acoustic guitar called a guitarón. Tostarena town itself somewhat resembles the Pueblo communities of Mesoamerica, with its apartment-style residences seemingly built out of stone or adobe mud. The rest of the landscape is an amalgamation of many different deserts from around the world. The red sand resembles the mesas of southern and central America, and the cacti and tumbleweeds give it a Wild West vibe. The sprawling sand dunes dotted with sandstone structures evoke Egypt. The famous inverted pyramid is a reference to both Mesoamerica and Egypt. Pyramids are well-known structures of both the ancient Egyptians and the Aztecs. The architecture is decorated with very Aztec designs and patterns, with a few Egyptian motifs. 
Both of these cultures are again referenced by the Jaxi, which resembles an Egyptian sphinx with a bit of Aztec flair. Jaguars were a significant part of Aztec culture. The Aztecs even had a special warrior unit known as the Jaguar. The final boss of the Sand Kingdom, Nuklatek, resembles an Olmec head, statues associated with the earliest known civilization of Mexico. There are also some smaller allusions to other cultures, such as the Easter Island-inspired Moais. So how does the music reflect this amalgamation of cultures? The theme of Tostarena Town itself reinforces the traditional Mexican feel. This style of music is mariachi, instantly recognizable because of its distinct style of violin playing, Mexican guitar own strumming, the accordion, and that prominent trumpet section. The theme for the ruins section of the map goes all out with combining every desert song cliché, and I mean that in the best way. It has Latin style strummed guitar, a flute which evokes Native American music, and what sounds like an Indian sitar. The electric guitar during the second part evokes the typical cowboy music of spaghetti westerns. Film composer Ennio Morricone comes to mind, known for his twanging electric guitar for soundtracks such as The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. All in all, this song is an impressive mashup of Latin folk music, spaghetti western film scores, traditional indigenous music, and Indian Hindustani music, making for a truly scorching desert theme. The Lake Kingdom is another eclectic blend of cultures. Visually, it seems to be primarily based on Greece. The architecture is inspired by the iconic marble pillars and arches of classical antiquity. Greece is also known for its islands, such as the Cycladic Islands of the Aegean Sea, which fits the aquatic surroundings of this kingdom and the small islands which are spread throughout the lake. Greece was a maritime civilization, which relied on traveling by sea, and one of its primary food sources was fish, which just so happened to be everywhere in the lake kingdom. Other elements of the Lake Kingdom seem to pull from France. The name Lake La Mode sounds very French, and may be derived from the phrase à la mode, which means fashionable or stylish. This is a fitting epithet, given that Lake La Mode is known for its fashionable clothing, which is also a further connection to the French, a culture known for its high fashion. Lastly, there are some allusions to Scotland. The locals are called Loch Ladies, which derives from the Scottish word for lake, and the presence of Dory the friendly plesiosaur serves as an homage to Scotland's famous cryptid, the Loch Ness Monster. The music here is very soothing and is a fitting accompaniment to the aquatic vibe of the kingdom. It's definitely a worthy successor to the relaxing water level themes of past Mario games, such as Dire Dire Docks or Deep Sea of Mare. I believe this music is derived from ancient Greek music, or at least our modern approximation of it, which fits the kingdom's architectural style. The music of the Lake Kingdom makes significant use of plucked string instruments, 
which just so happened to be very common in the musical tradition of ancient Greece. Ancient Greek musicians often used the class of instruments known as zithers, which are a type of chordophone played by strumming or plucking with the fingers. The main zithers used by the Greeks were the lyre, as well as the kitara, the predecessor of the modern guitar. The main theme of Lake Lamode specifically showcases a harp, which is a zither and a descendant of the ancient Greek lyre. Another version of the song has a bigger focus on the acoustic guitar, which harkens back to the ancient Greek kitara. The Wooded Kingdom is an interesting location, and does not have a striking resemblance to any real-world country at first glance. However, I think this region was influenced by the European region of the Alps, somewhere like Germany or Switzerland. The background visuals have a snowy mountain range which greatly resembles the Alps, and the dense boreal forest resembles the environment of the Alpine region. The connection to Germany is strengthened by the name. Steam Gardens was originally going to be called Kogwald, which is a German composite word for cog woods. Moreover, Steam Gardens is known for its mechanization. It almost has a steampunk aesthetic. This too can be tied to Germany, a country known for its technological advancements during its industrial revolution, including rail transport and tanks. The clockwork aesthetic is also a tie to Switzerland, a country famous for its fine craftsmanship such as high-quality Swiss watches. There is also the unique capturable enemy, the Uproot, a wacky, onion-like creature on extendable stilts. This may be a connection to another part of Europe, the Landes region in France. In this area, early farmers used wooden stilts to traverse the densely forested terrain. This connection may be a bit of a stretch, no pun intended, but I think it is worth bringing up. The Landis Forest is the largest pine forest in Europe, which definitely brings to mind the colossal pine trees of the Wooded Kingdom. The music for the Wooded Kingdom was one of the few Odyssey tracks composed by veteran Mario composer Koji Kondo the man responsible for most of the Mario series' iconic songs. When creating a theme for the arboreal environment of Steam Gardens, Kondo took a very unique approach in terms of genre. There's actually no direct connection between the musical style and the cultures the Wooded Kingdom is emulating. This song is inspired by the surf rock of the early 1960s, a subgenre of rock and roll. This genre was pioneered by artists such as the Beach Boys and Dick Dale, and was prominent within the surf culture of California. It is characterized by a unique style of electric guitar playing involving high reverb, lots of vibrato, pitch bending, and a technique called alternate picking, which creates a sort of tremolo effect. You can hear the reverb drenched guitar and lots of whammies or pitch bends in the Wooded Kingdom's theme. This theme also showcases high energy rhythm in the drums, a prominent bass line, a subtle brass section, and that groovy organ sound. Surf rock is also known for incorporating scales or musical modes that aren't typical in Western music drawing from a wide range of Mexican music, Indian and Middle Eastern music, traditional Greek and Eastern Mediterranean folk songs, as well as the Jewish style of klezmer. Without getting too deep into music theory, surf rock often uses harmonic minor scales, such as the Phrygian dominant mode, which is a defining sound of both Arabic and Spanish music. This unique flair is best exemplified by Dick Dale's iconic surf rock cover of Miserloo, a traditional Eastern Mediterranean song. Ah, ah. 
is a strange choice of genre for sure, especially considering that the kingdom is a forest, not a beach, and is based on the European Alps and not California. But I can't complain, this song is one of the most refreshing songs in the Mario series. It's like nothing we've ever heard in the series before, and personally, I think it's one of the best songs in Odyssey. This just goes to show that Koji Kondo remains the legendary king of Mario music. I believe that the Lost Kingdom is based on an amalgamation of countries throughout Southeast Asia and Oceania. Southeast Asia is known for its tropical and volcanic islands, which fits the dense jungles and rocky terrain of the Forgotten Isle to a T. Moreover, the Forgotten Isle hosts a number of brightly colored and often dangerous insects, which Australia is infamous for. This kingdom is also home to the reptilian Glidon, who is based on a flying lizard also known as a Draco, a species of lizard found in the densely wooded areas of the Philippines, Borneo, and other places throughout Southeast Asia. Based on the music, however, I would say this kingdom is primarily based on Indonesia. This type of music is a traditional style known as gamelan. Gamelan is a type of musical ensemble performed in the islands of Bali and Java in Indonesia. These ensembles are primarily comprised of percussive instruments, such as gongs, usually made of bronze and bamboo, plentiful resources throughout Southeast Asia. Each ensemble can have anywhere between 2 and 50 instruments, many of which you can hear in the theme of the Forgotten Isle. Throughout the entire song you can hear the Bonang tuned gongs. This is the same sort of instrument you can hear in Mario Kart 8's Thwomp Ruins, by the way. Another instrument is the Gendare, a metallophone played with a mallet, similar to a glockenspiel. The flute-like instrument you hear is called a suling, a bamboo pipe common throughout Indonesian music. You can hear seng seng cymbals and the double-sided kendang drum, which were used to mark the complex rhythm and tempo, which often fluctuate throughout the varying parts of a gamelan piece. There's one instrument here that's not a component of gamelan, and actually comes from a variety of African music. The unique percussion sound you just heard is a talking drum, an hourglass-shaped drum common in traditional West African music. It consists of two drums connected by leather cords. These cords are squeezed to regulate the tension on the drum head, thus modulating the pitch of the drum. When played the right way, these drums could mimic the human voice. Most sound like human humming, but skilled players could play whole phrases of human speech, hence the name. Aside from this one irregularity, the Lost Kingdom's music is pretty faithful to this Indonesian musical tradition. This song reflects the unusual rhythm and tempo of gamelan. It is in the mind-boggling 1116 time signature, an extremely uncommon musical meter by Western standards. Gamelan is characterized by interlocking parts built around a core melody, which is reflected well in this song. You can hear a variety of repetitive melodies layered over top of one another. It has a somewhat complex and unpredictable sound, but remains grounded by the steady and driving drum beat. Gamelan is a vital part of Balinese society. It has a crucial ceremonial role in the Hindu tradition and is also used for fun and entertainment, such as setting the soundtrack for dancing and Wayang shadow puppet performances. I think it's incredibly cool that Nintendo chose to look at such an obscure musical tradition for one of their biggest games. It's a great way to help such a fascinating but overlooked style of music reach a wider audience. Well, that about wraps it up for part one. In the next video, I will examine the remaining Mario Odyssey kingdoms, starting with the infectiously catchy big band sound of the fan favorite New Donk City. I hope you enjoyed this video and possibly learned something new. 
This is my first time trying a video like this, so please let me know if you liked it or think there's anything I could improve on. I'm trying to strike a nice balance between analysis, music theory, history, so it's a work in progress, but I hope it turned out okay. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.